Earth is Our Witness, where we invite inspired photographers and have a live conversation about interesting stories of interconnectedness. Today is a very special day, a very interesting day. In some ways, a sad day. In some days, in some ways, we, a day we can all learn from. Today is the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. A good friend of mine said uh, that the International Holocaust Remembrance Day is not just for Jews. It is a day for all of us because it's a reminder for what happens when fear and hatred take over the world. And today, so I thought, given the, given the importance of the day, we wanted to invite a really special photographer, a fine art photographer, Cole Thompson, Cole, I want to welcome you to Earth as a Witness. Thank you, Paramal. I appreciate you having me, especially on today. Yeah. Um, Cole and I were talking. We were actually going to do this talk a few days earlier, and we said, let's do it on this day. I'll tell you what I love about Cole's work. First of all, his images speak for themselves. But particularly in this case, what I love about Cole's work, which today's you know, collection is called The Ghosts of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Those are the most infamous concentration and extermination camps in Poland, is the spontaneity with which it was created and how it was executed. And to me, that's what is really interesting for how we're gonna connect photography and the photographer through beautiful, I dare I say the word beautiful, haunting images of the ghosts of Birkenau and Auschwitz. So with that, Cole, I want to hand it over to you to walk us through what happened, what you felt, and what, and what the story is behind the work. Thank you. I really do want to set the stage and explain a little bit about how I got there. Let me share my screen. The backstories are always important, yes. Um, it's important because I was an unwilling tourist. I didn't want to be there, and I want to tell how in the course of two hours, I came to create these two images. I found myself standing outside at Auschwitz, having a hard time breathing, trying to catch my breath, looking down at my feet. I had just come out of the tour. I, I couldn't finish it. I, I maybe was there for five minutes and I just had to get out. And as I was catching my breath and walking and looking at my feet, began to wonder about the others who had taken these same footsteps and who were now dead, those who might have walked in the same path on their way to the gas chamber. But I've kind of dropped you into the middle of the story. So I wanna go back to 1981. 1981 is when my son number two was born, Cody. He grew up, he graduated college, and he joined the Peace Corps and was assigned to work in Ukraine. There he met his future wife, Erica, and in 19, oh no, no, 2008, my wife and I went to visit him. And as is my practice when I go on a photo trip, I make no preparations. I want a blank slate. I don't look into the country. I don't want to look into guidebooks. I don't look at the must-see sites. I want to go there and find something that inspires me. So as I was in Ukraine, I was inspired to create the project Ukrainians with Eyes Shut. Then mm. the second leg of our trip was to go off to Poland and we took a train ride over to Krakow and we stayed for a few days. Now in Poland, I of course knew that Auschwitz-Birkenau was nearby. It was about an hour out of Krakow. And over the months as the family was discussing possible itineraries, it would come up and I, I hoped, I prayed that we would not go there because I'm a sensitive. I am a person who takes on the feelings of a sad story, a sad movie or a sad place. And I desperately didn't wanna go. But the family outvoted me and off we went. We took a bus from Krakow to Auschwitz-Birkenau. And on the ride, I determined that I would not photograph there. I decided that it was a sacred place and that photographing there would perhaps be sacrilegious or at least irreverent. So as I was getting off the bus, I asked the driver if I could leave my gear there and he said, no, I needed to take it with me. He wouldn't be responsible. You begin the tour by walking through those gates. And of course, everyone asks, what do those words say? Work sets you free. And you think, how cruel. And then my first impression of the camps were, wow, this is a beautiful place. This must be where the guards live. Where are the extermination camps? Where's the barracks where the the prisoners were kept. And I soon realized that 
these nice brick buildings were in fact Auschwitz. You go into the tour and you begin by looking at this book. On the left is a beautiful black and white photograph of each prisoner, and on the right a detailed history, their family name, their possessions, everything about them. And your head starts to swim. Why are they taking such care to document people that are going to either work to death or gas? Then we walk into the room with the iconic piles, a pile of glasses, a pile of human hair used to stuff mattresses, and a pile of bridge work yanked from the mouths of the dead. And I'm not claustrophobic, but at that moment, I just could not breathe. And I signaled to my family to continue with the tour that I needed to go outside. And once outside, I just walked, looking at my feet, catching my breath. And again, I thought, who else had taken these steps on the way to the gallows or to the gas chambers? And then I began to wonder metaphorically, are the spirits of those who lived and died at Auschwitz still lingering? And then this thought just hit me. I needed to photograph the ghosts of those people who had lived and died. And so I began photographing ghosts. What I did was I used long exposures to take photographs of the other visitors at the camp, turning them into ghosts. They stood in proxy for those people who had lived and died. I faced three challenges though. The first was I didn't really know how to create ghosts. I had had scant experience when I once created this image, the angel Gabriel, a 30 second exposure. And I noticed that some people who had lingered ghosted so I had a, a, a basic understanding. The second challenge was that people in Europe are so polite that each time I set up my camera, they would clear out of the way. And of course, unbeknownst to them, I needed them in those images. So I very quickly devised a method. I became the loud American talking loudly on my cell phone, and I would turn my back to the camera until the people would linger back in. Then using a remote shutter, I would take the picture. And the third challenge was the biggest. I had 45 minutes left at Auschwitz and an hour at Birkenau. So I literally ran from location to location, photographing and creating these ghosts. One of the biggest benefits, the blessings that have come into my life from this project is meeting Holocaust survivors. And there's very few left, like our World War II veterans. I was exhibiting this work at the Dallas Holocaust Museum when I saw this woman, Edith, being pushed around in a wheelchair and she was leaning forward, looking at each image very carefully. And I approached her and I said, hi, my name is Cole. These are my images. And she raised this bony crooked finger and she pointed at them and said, these are my images. Edith had been interned and had survived at Auschwitz-Birkenau. And it was amazing to me how she must have felt seeing those images. A few years ago, on this same day, I was able to address over 100 survivors at the Simon Wiesenthal Center in Los Angeles on the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz-Birkenau. And it is amazing to shake the hands. You get a chill in your body shaking these people's hands. They are living history. And one person I met, a survivor of Birkenau, I met her in Rochester when I was doing an exhibit there of this work. Eva had been interned with her mother, father, sister, and niece in 1944, and the men and women were separated. Then they approached in a group of five with a stranger, and Dr. Mengele separated the mother and niece to the left. They went to the gas chambers and were burned. And to the right, Eva and her sister and the stranger. They shaved their heads and put, took them to the barracks. And looking out the window, the stranger said, see that smoke? at your mother and father being burned. Eva was on a work detail of a thousand women digging trenches to stop the Allied tanks. And then the rumors came of the Allies approaching and the uh, six week death march began, marching them through Bavaria. And each evening, every woman who was struggling to keep up, they would pick and line up and shoot. Well, one day it was winter and Eva had one bad shoe and her foot was becoming frostbitten and she couldn't keep up and she was told that she would die that evening. And they lined her up with the other women and they took a machine gun and shot them. And Eva says, I don't know if I fainted or I feigned death, but I fell and lay still. And in the morning, the SS men would come and walk on these women and anyone who showed signs of life, they would shoot them and she survived. She spent two days in the woods nearby a town 
afraid to go into town because she wasn't certain if they would turn her in or they would help her. Well, she finally got so desperate, she went into town and asked for food. And the people were good to her, but gave her very rich food of chicken and dumplings. And she almost died because she had been living on a, a diet of almost just water. Uh, they turned her over to a doctor, a woman whose husband was in the SS, and this woman brought her back to life. And she learned that the husband had been forced into the SS, and she later wrote during the Nuremberg trials a letter on his behalf, and he was returned home. It is really an honor to meet these people, and that has been the, the biggest blessing that has come out of this portfolio. Wow. I, I'm literally choking up during this. It's amazing to shake hands with these people. It just is, and I, there's so few left, just like our World War II veterans, that you know, their, their time has come, and certainly COVID has not helped any. Cole, I have so many questions. Is it okay if I ask a few questions uh, as yeah. you show the images now? Um, yeah. thank, you for, thank you for sharing so eloquently the emotional rawness that you felt. I got to say, I, there are probably three stages of dealing with this. The stage I'd say, the stage one is, I put myself in those shoes, is I read about this, I've seen movies about this, like many of us. Um, and yes, it is shocking to, to kind of confront what humanity is capable of, unfortunately. The second stage is you, is you have actually been there and have taken the time to not try away, but actually, even though you might be reluctant, but going with the flow and expressing it in, in, in such a hauntingly beautiful way what has happened so that people like me and others can actually face it. And obviously I'll say the stage three is for the survivors, the victims, their families. I just spoke to a colleague of mine who's hopefully joining us live, Sarah, and she talked about her aunt uh, her, her grandmother and her sister actually are survivors and there's a movie made on them and she talked about what it meant. Um, and in some ways it feels like a distant memory. You know, it's something that we would like to believe that it happened in 1945 and no more. Um, but to actually, for you to share even stories from current people, survivors, it just brings it home that something like this can happen Hope doesn't happen, but can also happen in the future. So I guess my question to you is, does that, do you lose hope in humanity when you see something like this? I'd like to tell a short story of something that happened the very first time I met some survivors. When I went to my very first Holocaust museum to exhibit this work, the Dallas one, in fact, I was expecting to see a room full of angry, bitter people, especially given that they were celebrating the, the, uh, uh, the allies coming and releasing the prisoners at Auschwitz-Birkenau. And I, I just, I, I guess I thought they would be angry of the life that had been robbed, the family members that had been robbed, the health that had been robbed. And instead I saw a wonderfully upbeat and gregarious and happy people. And that really puzzled me at first. And then I realized that it was those people who survived, the people who had faith in humanity and the goodness of mankind. There will always be bad people, but I think the bulk of people are good. And I saw that, how forgiving they were and how uh, just full of life they were. So I was encouraged by their attitudes. They had been through that and they still had a good outlook on life. So how could I not? Mm, thank you. This is a... This is the first image when it kind of from my point of view, entering the camp. And again, that, that saying, uh, uh, work will set you free. And every day, the prisoners, they were in work duty and they would march in and out of that gate. And I just couldn't imagine what they must think as they walk through that gate, saying work will make you free, will set you free. Uh, this is, uh, you, as you and I talk, my favorite image of the group, Auschwitz number 14. Um, I like everything about it, but why don't you describe yes, what you love? I love, I love, and I don't know if love is the right term as you and I have said. So dear audience, forgive me if I say I love this about this image uh, because it's not trying to betray the emotional depth of this work. 
visually, I'll tell you what I like about this, what appeals to me, and probably a right way to say it is what what captures you know my my attention is knowing the topic, knowing what happened here. This image beautifully captures in an iconic way what this place stands for, unfortunately. And it is tension. It is a lack of freedom. You are trapped. There is no hope is what it feels. And that's represented by the barbed wires. You know, there's tension there. There is also the tension between the ghost and the tower. You know, the ghosts are nameless. There's no name. There's not one person. It's like they don't matter. Their identity does not matter. They don't matter. They're irrelevant. They're almost walking corpses is what it signifies. And in the tower is power, is hatred for these people. And that tension, I feel that tension sitting here, even via you know, a, a, an internet call, if you will, I feel that tension. Um, you have also so beautifully captured that the people in power have light because the tower is lit up. But the vulnerable, millions, and we're talking actually, if you look at the numbers, a million people were gassed there and 7 million overall. I mean, that is staggering. So in some ways, um, each of your images and the people in them are an ode to the people who are not with us because of this. So I love the way you have captured, and like I said, I use the term love, but um, the tension that you've captured with the light. Um, and the darkness. It's a tension between light and darkness. And unfortunately here, the light is with the evil in some way. So that's what I love. Obviously the leading lines uh, that go to the pivotal point, you know, at, uh, of the tower, um, that all makes, you know, it's just beautiful composition as well. Uh, you, you do a way better job of describing these images than I do. I'm going to let you do these from the, for the rest of them. Here's okay. the next uh, one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, this is uh, only different in that the ghosts are different than many of the other ones. Very wispy, ethereal, very almost not there ghosts. Uh, it was a beautiful blue sky day there. And it's so hard. You don't want to portray Auschwitz as a beautiful place, but it, it could be portrayed that. The buildings and trees were beautiful. But I wanted the image, I love a dark image. I love a high contrast. And I wanted those ghosts to be the focal point. This is almost uh, atypical of most of the images. Mm -hmm. This is where Eva and her family were separated into left and right groups, uh, where the train would release the, you know, the cattle car would release the people packed in there and the Mangala would say left or right, death or life. Well, a quick death or a slow death, really, not death or life. And then someone had left those flowers there. The uh, yeah, that's actually, this is, I'd say, is my, my second favorite image, personally. I love the, the lines. And again, the train tracks have a huge significance, you know, in the concentration camps, because that's how they got all the uh, European Jews and, and others for extermination. Um, yeah. it, it also tells a beautiful story in some ways, like you have these flowers and then you have the train tracks and then you, it, you lead to the people, you're, you are led to the people, the ghosts, right? It's just a very interesting image. The, the thing I also find intriguing, and again, this is subjective, it's my personal interpretation, if you will, which art is also meant to be in some ways, is you see the lines diverge, right? The trail the train tracks diverge. And to me, it's a metaphor for, you might be coming with your friends or family in that train wagon, if you will, but you're gonna soon lose them and you just don't know what happens to them. You might never know, you might never hear, except for that sad story when you, you, know, when you said about the stories, that's your mom and dad burning. Uh, but to me, these lines that diverge, uh, it's, it's a very sad image in some ways, very poignant image. This is the entrance to Birkenau, uh, the actual camp. And this actually does look like a death camp where Auschwitz looked beautiful with these nice brick buildings and trees. Birkenau just looked evil. It was horse stalls that they crammed people in. 
the living conditions were horrific. Um, it had a much different feel than Auschwitz, although just as evil things took place in both camps. Hmm. I'm just going to read out a comment from Cynthia. No words, Cole. Your photos are amazing. And that's what I suspect is the work is incredible. The, the topic is so powerful that it's sometimes difficult to articulate. And I'm trying my best and I'm struggling a little bit, uh, I'm sure. What's the difference between Auschwitz and Birkenau? Tell us a little bit for people who haven't been there. Well, I, I thought that it was Auschwitz, and then I was corrected. My mentor at the time was Jewish, and she corrected me. It was the Auschwitz-Birkenau camp. They were physically mm. separated by a number of miles, but over the years, I guess there were a great number of camps, all a part of the Auschwitz-Birkenau system. And I'm not really certain as to why, but uh, I think there were Auschwitz one, two, and three, and then uh, there were many camps. Uh, the treatment was equally horrific, regardless of where you were at. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I would like to point out that the reason I chose, I don't know when this idea came into my head, but I, like I said, I didn't intend to photograph there. But once I was photographing, I just knew that I didn't want to portray this place as a historical dead museum, looking at artifacts of years gone by. I wanted to try to make it more alive and more human uh, and there's a, an image coming up that will tie into this. Let's see if it's the next one. Not yet. We're back now to Auschwitz uh, at one of the barracks, number five. Mm. And... I wanted to ask, um, this is this one, and then there's another barrack that we're going to see soon, which is, I believe is number 11. Yes. I think the... The fact that it has a number versus the same image without a number, there's something about the number that makes it, drives it home in such a real way. And uh, given the black and white treatment, it just feels like it could be happening now. I mean, it feels so real that, and I'm glad it's not happening now, but it almost feels like it makes it even more real. The number makes it less abstract and more concrete. Is that the feeling you had when you took that photo as well? To be honest with you, I was just so overwhelmed with 45 minutes and having this vision in my head of what I wanted to do. There was not a lot of thinking going on. It was mostly just trying to capture this, this image I had in my head of what I wanted to do with this limited amount of time. So most of my eye reflection has occurred after the fact. And truthfully, I'm glad because it was such a depressingly sad place that... Mm. Uh, to have just walked around as a tourist would have been overwhelming for me. Yeah, yeah. How, tell us a bit about your vision for, you are a fine art black and white photographer and you do primarily in black and white. Only black and white, yes. Only black and white. How important, let's say hypothetically, you're not just a black and white, you're not an only black and white photographer. Would you still have chosen this to be in black and white? And if so, why? I think so. I don't know why it just feels that way. I, I'm so biased though, because of black and white that I, I can't imagine a subject that would not look good in it, but I couldn't imagine these being in color. Mm. In fact, that I truthfully don't like it when I see many of these period pieces being colorized. Uh, I, I just, I, I, they just feel like they should be in black and white. What do you think? Do you, could you imagine I these in color? No, I cannot. I cannot imagine these in color myself. I think uh, I'm not a black and white photographer, uh, but had I been in your shoes, I would definitely have also chosen black and white. Um, reasons could be, you know, different than yours, but I think I would agree with their assessment that it makes it in some ways timeless. Um, it also visually is more striking in some ways. Um, because you start seeing things that you otherwise can miss in color. For example, in this shot, if it's a color image, you probably have trees and leaves. And, you know, what's essential to this particular image is three things, you know, uh, prop, you know, one is the halt, you know, um, there's a kind of a warning sign there, that pole. Second is again, that wire, you know, the barbed wire that's saying that you are imprisoned and it's a very central visual vignette. And third is obviously the, the prisoners. So I think those three things, it's in some ways so simple and minimalistic that often, as we say, what you show, what you don't show is as equally important as what you show, you know? 
So reducing the color would distracting here, I think. I, yeah. With black and white, I can control where I want the focus to be. And it was the, yeah. like you said, the, the fence, the people and the, and this was the first image that I had run into the politeness, the extreme politeness of the Europeans. Mm. Uh, and this is where I worked out my solution of how to get those people back in because, you know, I needed those people in there and they were being so considerate by not entering the shot. So thank goodness that I, uh, again, played the loud American and uh, lived up to expectations. That was, uh, that, was a, 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 that was an interesting, spontaneous moment, you know, where you improvised. What's a, on a, on a different topic as photographers, what's a lesson, is there a lesson learned here where if you will, there's some wisdom where how do you execute your vision? When, when in this case, the people would be polite and move out of your frame and you said, no, 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 you are actually central to the frame. You don't have time to explain. How do you, uh, if you had to extrapolate that wisdom and the learning for photographers who want to capture something, how do you go with the flow and how do you actually make it happen? Well, my philosophy is always figure it out. Don't say I can't do it until I figure it out. Do it, figure it out, move on. But once you have a vision, that vision may not be there later. You got to do it while you have it. At least I do. Mm -hmm. I had that vision. I had two hours. It had to be done. And you find a way you find a way. I'm going to ask a question. Um, my really good friend, Art Wolf, who generally joins us, he's the artist in residence for Earth is Our Witness. He couldn't join today because he's on the road um, or just back and exhausted and jet lagged. Is it okay if I ask a question on his behalf? He saw this collection. He was deeply moved. And I'm going to read out because we have some Art Wolf fans too here. So I'm going to read out a comment. And then I have a question on his behalf, if that's okay. Um, his comment is, this is fascinating work, Cole. Like you, Cole, I avoid uncomfortable situations and Nazi death camps rate pretty high on that list. I love the fact that you preserved and found a way around the emotional difficulty of the situation. The haunting shadows that you were able to create with long exposures of contemporary visitors and tourists our placeholders and stand-ins for those who died and even the few who survived the camp. These are ghosts of the past, but sadly could also be ghosts of the future. A reminder that such human tragedy, yes, did happen, but also could happen again. So that's his uh, very poignant remarks about, about your work. Well, thanks, Art. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm afraid it probably will happen again. Um, as optimistic as those people, those survivors I met and using their example of looking for the good in people, I'm afraid that we are always destined to make the mistakes of our past. And, you know, Santa Ana said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Well, most of us only remember the past of our lifetime. I can remember the lessons of World War II, Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, but I don't have any memory beyond that. And not many of us do. So I, I, I'm convinced we're going to keep repeating the mistakes of the past, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully there's enough people who are energized on this subject that there will be some way to perhaps stop it or to lessen it. But I mean, look in the world over the last 20 years of some of the genocides that have occurred it seems to be central to man's nature. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask, um, I wish I could say, I don't agree with you because uh, like I said at the upfront, we are capable of some wonderful things and we're also capable of this, unfortunately. Um, a question from Art, like I said, Cole, when you were photographing, were you, were you thinking about the, how were you thinking about the duality of the moment, which is to articulate this question, you're taking photos of something that, trying to capture the vision of something that happened decades back and yet you're present. So how do you go back and forth in your mind, the duality of the moment? Mm. Well, like I said previously, honestly, I was so engrossed with the ticking clock and trying to exercise that vision that I didn't really have much time for thinking of anything at the moment. Yeah. Uh, 
I was engulfed. I had a deadline and I, I knew what I needed to do and I had to do it. Yeah. This is another, there, yeah. mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, this is a very different one. A lot of ghosts walking down the two boulevards, if you will. I, I like this one a lot and I don't know why there were many, many ghosts here. Um, don't know. I can't put into words why I like it. I just do. Everybody has, you know, different tastes and different favorites, but this is a close second for me. Hmm. You know, it's, it's really interesting, right? Why uh, photography or any art form can actually at the same time be very subjective. What someone likes, you just can't tell. Um, you know, I, I told you which one is my favorite and my number two, and you have a different favorite and number two, you know, in some ways. And, but I do say, I, I agree. It's a beautiful image. And so is this one. Tell me about this one. Well, this is Birkenau again, uh, again, the a very evil feeling place. You felt it here more than at Auschwitz just because of the barracks. Uh, and I've had many people comment that they interpret this as uh, people who are naked, stripped of clothing and wandering about. It is really, there's a, a slide coming up, an image coming up. It, it'll be great to talk about the different interpretations people can put on an image. And that's why I never like to say what an image means because it is subjective and it is for each person with their point of reference to decide what it means to them. Hmm. Strangely enough, of the 15 images, only three came from Birkenau. And this is one of the three. Hmm. I'm going to read out a comment from Laurie Goodman. And I'm going to read out, uh, for all our friends joining live, please do share your comments and questions, because this is a collective shared experience. Um, Laurie's comment is, there's an aching feeling that the ghosts evoke in a way that the physical surroundings alone never could. Can't look. Can't look away. And Laurie's such poignant thoughts. You can't quite look, you can't quite look away and you feel stuck. You feel literally stuck just like the prisoners in these, in these barbed wires. I'm going to um, um, read out another comment from Jan uh, Wilder. I like this one a lot too. It has me in tears. Yeah. I'll tell you what I uh, respond to this image personally is... Uh, the parallels between the ghosts, the people, and the clouds, you know, and both are fleeting. And uh, just like clouds, you know, formations keep changing and then they're gone. So are the prisoners here. So there is an interesting uh, parallel there in that story. And then what stays the same is the, the camps and the barbed wires. And in some ways, to me, those reflect what he just said is the evil in us remains there, unfortunately. You know, I wish it were gone, but that's just, in some ways, sounds like it's part of being human. Is we are capable of profound things and also equally unprofound things. Yeah, you and I briefly talked about some of the wondering if I had been there, how would I have acted? Mm -hmm. Would I have stood up? for the Jewish people, or would I have become a monster, or maybe the middle ground where I would have just been a lemming following along with all the people, as long as I didn't have to get my hands dirty, but I would turn my head away from the ugly truth. We all would like to think we would be heroes, but I don't know that you ever know for certain until you're put in that position. You know, yes, you and I did, talk about that. And the question I said I'm going to ask you is, is it, is it as simple as that's the evil them, the Nazis or Hitler? Is it as simple as that? Is it as black and white as that? Or is it, you know what? Me in the situations, me, Parimal, I could have done the same thing that, you know, uh, some of these people did to the Jews. Um, and um, I'd hate to say, I mean, I'd love to say in some ways that no, not me, but I don't think I'd be honest because I just don't know. We don't know how we get either manipulated into situations or how our insecurities and fear and hatred can be used. Um, and we let them use it. I don't want to say can be used because it seems like we are puppets, but we have a responsibility too. And I'm sure I've done some wrong things in life. And um, so I'd, I'd say I'd embrace that vulnerabilities that 
it's not that people are good or bad necessarily, although there are some good and bad people, yes, for sure. But it's that people are people and good people are capable of doing bad things and good people are capable of doing very horrible things. And that includes Cole you, that includes me, that includes many of us, for sure. Have you ever seen that photograph? It was Hitler was speaking and the crowds were all doing the Nazi salute. And in the mm. middle of the crowd, there's one gentleman with his arms crossed with a scowl on his face. How brave must he have been to be in the middle of a Hitler rally with everyone, every lemming around them saluting, saying Heil Hitler and for him to defy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, that courage. no, I, I, I agree. I, um, I have not seen that image. I would love to see that image. I will look that image up. If you talk to, we just interviewed um, a really world-renowned anthropologist, Wade Davis, um, a month back. And there's many anthropologists who have studied things like this. I'm not saying Wade in particular, but in general. And what they'll say is, this part of us being human, um, there are a few different things going on. One is what we don't understand, what is not like us, we fear. And you also look at tribes. And we just uh, I just talked to Phil Borges last week and we talked about tribes. Is that tribes and uh, indigenous cultures are incredibly inclusive. But the circle of compassion is very small. It's within that tribe. As soon as they, one tribe talks to another, there is a lot of hostility, right? And if you look at Jared Diamond's book, Guns, Germs, and Steer, and you'll see that time and again, is what we don't understand, what doesn't look like us, we fear. And there's been a lot of studies where you put strangers in a room and you let them be by themselves. In a few minutes, you will see them segregate by, in some ways, the skin of the color or some similarities, not differences, right? And this is essentially a extreme case of that, if you will. It's an outlier, but it's a very sad outlier. It's an extreme case of that is we fear what we don't understand. And number two, the sense of belonging is so strong that it's very hard to be that one person who will not say hail Hitler when everyone else is. And we rationalize in our brain. The third thing is we rationalize is if everyone else is doing it, it must be true. If everyone else is saying it, it must be true. Yes. And, uh, and then you start rationalizing and you tap into your own insecurities that yes, they are inferior, we are superior, is what's going on and we buy into the narrative. And long before you know it, we are part of the problem, you and me included. So. And I think I, I see that today with the two political parties. Uh, the one party will demonize the other, the other will demonize mm -hmm. that one. Anything that they say is bad, anything we say is good. And I did an experiment once where I took quotes and attributed that to the person of their party and they would agree with them. Then I told them it was really a person from the other party. But people automatically said, no, that blue party is bad. So anything a blue person says is evil. And the reds did the same thing. And that's that tribalism. We just don't think for ourselves. We don't evaluate for ourselves. We let go of critical thinking and we just go with everyone else. And it's a sad thing. We all mm. need to think yeah, I want to talk about you know, this image. This is the yeah, only time yeah. that I got out of my head photographing and was actually angry. And I shouldn't have been, but let me tell you what happened. This is a group of school children, and they were obviously on a field trip. But their behavior just shocked me. The laughing, the joking around, the playing with absolutely no respect. Now, I realize they're children, but still it made me angry. And then it made me sad because... Again, I don't think kids today really relate too much to what happened in World War II. It was too long ago. It was the olden days. And I suspect many think those things can't happen today. They were primitives back then. We're an evolved people. So this was the only time I became mm. a, a non-photographer and actually at one point wanted to go and scold them for their, their irreverence. Mm. Mm. Oh, there's the number 11 that you had been talking oh, about. Oh, number earlier. 11. No, this is so hauntingly powerful image. Oh, my God. Yeah. This is, this leaves me speechless, these images. This is another, uh, one of my favorites, just the darkness leading down to this tunnel of light and the ghosts, uh, and again, with another guard tower. Um, definitely a I'm, favorite. Look. I'll read out another comment um, from 
um, Stephen Dorton. Stephen is one of our uh, really regular patrons and fans. Stephen, thank you so much. Stephen went through a personal loss as well recently. Um, each of these images have a beautiful eerie feeling towards them as the haunting of the living souls of the horrific period of time in human history. So many stories come out of the images. It's just not the ghost images, but the buildings speak as well of the stories, as well as the landscape of the souls that still linger in those places. A deep sadness, coldness to the images of a history that should not be forgotten. History has a way to repeat itself if we let it instead of learning from it and making a difference so it won't happen again. Thank you so much, Stephen. This is a beautiful comment. Yeah, and it's not, you know, as you pointed out earlier, I think in a private conversation, it's just not the Jews. It could be homosexuals. It could be people of color. It could be anything that we perceive as different. And, uh, and I, I'm grateful to the Jewish people who never make it just about the Jews, but about any group who might be persecuted and murdered. Yeah, yeah. By the way, on the previous image, if you go back, visually speaking, it's really interesting that, you know, you have the tree and the tower you know, in some ways, um, just line up. It's just a beautiful composition as well. Haunting composition is what I'm going to call it instead of saying beautiful. Well, hauntingly beautiful. Not much to say on this one. Beautiful. This is a... Uh, oh, beautiful. this is the one. That... I have a question on this one, but go ahead. You explain, and then I have a question on this one. Well, it's I mean, the only I... image that I included a living person. Uh, that and... was my question. That was my question. Told my question. <laughs> and I, I have my own thoughts, but I've heard at least five different interpretations of what it means. So, what do you think it means, Paramal? So, it. So, I'll tell you my instincts when I saw this. My instinct was, I'm curious. I actually don't know what's going on because no other image has a non-blur, non-ghost entity, if you will. So I tried to ask myself what could be going on because clearly, I mean, you know what you're doing. You're a fine art photographer. This cannot be a mistake. So there's a reason why you have that. Uh, my first instinct was it's probably where it's probably one of the you know soldiers. It's signifying the person in authority. That could be one. Uh, the second explanation I had was, and by the way, this is all I'm riffing top of mind here as I'm as you asked me this question because I wasn't expecting you to ask me questions. It's my job to ask you questions. <laughs> is uh, is it's in some ways it, that person represents us. This conversation, you and I and our audience right now, and uh, it is just removed by time. In a way, that person is everyone on this audience. You and I looking at the work, and instead of looking at the work through Zoom and Instagram and Facebook and YouTube by just being there. So in a way, it's looking back at history and seeing, huh, what do I take of this? Do I take anything of this? Um, do I take nothing of this and repeat itself? And what? That to me is my personal explanation of this image. Well, you've given me a couple of uh, ones I haven't heard. Okay. For me, what, I've just, the, what I read into it, and everybody gets to read what they want into it, of course, but here was a man, a visitor at the camp who was completely unaware of the ghost lingering around him. Hmm. Yeah, and I love I love those ghosts. How they're you know bunching up to go into the building. Hmm. I'm gonna uh, read uh, Donna's. Actually, if you go back, by the way, that other yeah. Let's come back to this image. But if you go back, uh, Donna Rawlings' observation is he's another observer who sees the ghost as Cole does. He's respectfully observing. Hmm. So see, that's exact opposite of what you said. And it's yeah. so amazing. Look at that. Look at this. I mean, uh, and that's, that's the way it should be. Everybody should get should out be. of it what they get out of it. Yeah. I, mean, I got one more from a good friend, Lalit. Lalit, my interpretation is the soul of the people entering the chamber watching go. The soul of the collective people watching themselves go into the chamber. Beautiful, Lalit. I mean, I, I got to ask you, um, Cole. Not particularly about Auschwitz, but in general, since you do a lot of fine art photography. How important is it in your work to not 
as a photographer, draw a very concrete conclusion, but let the observer draw their own conclusions. And what does it do to the engagement? How does it change a perspective? It's, it's absolutely essential I not tell people what an image means. Um, I can tell the story behind it or the, how I got there, but I never would want to tell a person what an image means because it is up to them. And uh, I've often had people say, what does this image mean? And I say, look, if a picture is worth a thousand words, why try to explain it with a few paltry words? Let the image speak for itself. What does it mean to you? Mm. That's the only thing that matters. What does it yeah. mean to you? Yeah, true. Uh, one more question from uh, actually my good friend, uh, Sarah Shum. Uh, Sarah, I'm so glad that you're joining us live. I'm just curious if making the image being a square shape had something to do with balance or the photo having a feeling of the time frame, or I'm going to put some words in her mouth, which is, is it to have this constrained feeling of the tension? I can't give you a logical reason. I can only tell you is that's how I saw it in my mind. That's what my mm. vision said, a square image. And I, I don't often shoot in squares, but I love the square. And it just felt right for these images. It just felt there. That's and great. the final image, the gas chamber and the oh ghost escaping. I could not bring myself to go in there. I don't think I could ever go back to any death camp. Uh, it's just a very sad place. And I know that sad places have their function. It's to remind us, but it just weighed too heavily on me and I would never want to go back. Mm. This is also a favorite in some ways, very haunting, very haunting. Um, I personally have claustrophobia and I don't know what, what'll happen to me. You know, I don't know that I would probably go even as a tour. And then if I just hear myself say that, to say that as a tour, I wouldn't go in because I have claustrophobia. I feel that claustrophobia even looking, sitting here in my chair in Seattle. I feel that. And now imagine what those people went through. You know, mm -hmm. uh, here is just the feeling in my head and I'm, I'll be okay, I know that. Um, I, I gotta say the, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very evocative, emotionally charged image. Uh, to me, this one, along with the first one of the tower and then the rails are my top three favorites, personal favorites. And um, I almost feel like I would someday love to buy one or three of these images for my home as a reminder. Uh, and I'm again going to quote, you know, Sarah Schoen. Um, Sarah is the one who, uh, Sarah, inspired by your Facebook comment about today, is it's reminder not just for Jews, but for all of us. No matter what our caste, creed, sex, nationality, sexual orientation might be, is that this is what happens when uh, hatred and fear take over the world and not love and compassion. And this is what happens when differences are manipulated to an advantage and not similarities to build bridges between all of us. Cool. So 15, I'm gonna... images, 15 images in two hours. It was a uh project of love and i'm i'm convinced i was inspired to do it i am glad i did it i am grateful that they have i hope touched people to think about the subject in a different way and i'm just grateful every time i'm allowed to exhibit these to people yeah i'm gonna uh, i have a couple more questions as we end this final one or two questions perhaps two uh, but before that, I'm going to read, uh, actually, let me read the comment towards the end, because it's a beautiful comment that, that uh, one of our audience members wrote for you. Um, my, my question is, the driver who refused to take care of your gear, and by the way, I got to say to the audience, we don't, we don't rehearse these questions. You know, uh, these are all questions that literally are based on what Ola said. I'm going to respond to those in real time because this is a very informal chat, a very authentic chat. You know, do you, do you feel that's destiny in some ways? Was it meant to be? Do you wonder about that? I wonder more about what had happened if he would have said, sure, leave him in here and I'll lock the bus up because it would have driven me absolutely crazy to have had a vision 
and to not have been able to execute it. That just would have been the worst pain. So I am so grateful that uh, he would not let me leave the equipment. Hmm. Good. My last question, and before we wrap it up, having witnessed, Cole, what you have witnessed here, if you had one message for humanity, what would that be and why? I guess a Holocaust takes some bad people, but it really depends on the masses being sheep and following. Don't be a sheep. Think for yourself. That would be my message. Bad men cannot do bad things without the support of a lot of people. Don't be one of them. That's, uh, that's well said. That's well said, Cole. The, uh, it just reminds me of another photographer uh, I hosted, Manishur Degati, who spoke about the Iranian revolution. And I asked the same question to him, and his answer was, don't be careful of the words from people in power. Look at their actions. Don't be manipulated. In some ways, don't be the sheep. Cole, I'm just going to end this with this comment from Vered Gaylor. Oh, Vered is my mentor. Oh, wow. Vered, there you go. So what, what's, I didn't know that. What serendipity that I caught off so many comments. The one comment that I feel best encapsulates what you have just done here as a gift to all of us. Thank you so much, Cole. You have created the best memorial program of the Holocaust I have ever seen. And where did I agree? I've seen a lot of movies and read a lot. But this, in spite of being so contemporary in some ways and not a period old photos, you've just uh, shown us and made us walk through what people witnessed back in the day. If I may, I must, I would be ungrateful not to comment on Vered's role in all of this. Vered was the person who took me, a photographer, one who believed in documenting and showing you what I saw with my eyes and convincing me to create through my vision. And Vered is responsible for my metamorphosis from photographer to artist. And I will be always indebted to her. Um, I also am so grateful because of her example of her activism. Uh, she was, her parents both were sent to camps and survived and they all reunited, reunited in Israel. So she's been through a lot and lived on the edge of all of that. But I'm very grateful, Vera, that you could watch. And also I want to say, Phil, thank you for everything. Cole, thank you so much um, for all our audience dialing in. Thank you so much for your questions and comments. Um, yes, it was intense. This was probably the most intense Earth is a Witness episode we have seen, and that's to be expected. If you liked it, uh, if, you, if you felt this was worthy of your time, please do like it and share. If you're on YouTube, please do subscribe. And we'll be back for more. Next week is going to be uh, Simon Benny on Tuesday, Tales from Jerusalem. So another interesting topic. And with that, Cole, thank you so much, my friend. Someday I will take you to India. <laughs> and, and what I would be intrigued to know is what does a black and white photographer do in India full of bursting color? And that is something that I'll be uh, witnessing. You do your thing in India. Sound good? Good. good. Thank okay. You very much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Good night.